Hi everyone and uh, welcome back to chapter 26. The photograph that you see here was taken with an ion microscope and this is a device that makes use of uh, the de Broglie wavelength of uh, gas ions, right? And you're going to remember uh, what I'm talking about when I say de Broglie wavelength, wavelength uh, from chapter 25. In this case, uh, we're talking about uh, looking at a sample of uh, platinum at a very high magnification, right? Every bright spot that you see here shows you the position of individual platinum atoms. It's quite beautiful, quite remarkable. Photographs like this are going to reinforce the idea that all matter is made up of very, very small particles that we call atoms, right? Advances in science at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, led most physicists to believe that these atoms themselves are made up of even smaller particles, some of which are positive charges or negative charges, right? Unfortunately, you can go that down that deep so far. The, even the most powerful microscopes cannot show us the internal structure of the atom. So many theories were put forward about the structure of the atom, and when uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't until there was a series of experiments that was done, done by a guy named Ernest Rutherford and his colleagues around 1910 that, believe, uh, that led us to the birth of the model we now use and we now call the nuclear atom, right? So how did they do this? Well, uh, there were a couple of guys uh, with Rutherford named Geiger and Marston. They fired a beam of alpha particles at a very thin piece of gold foil. So at the same time, they used a zinc sulfide detector and attached it to a microscope and they moved it around the foil to detect the directions which alpha particles would travel after they struck this gold foil, right? So this was the very first alpha scattering experiment. What they found was most of the alpha particles passed through the foil with little or no deviation at all, right? And only a small number of particles were deviated through an angle of more than 10 degrees and an extremely, extremely small number of particles, like one in 10,000, right, were deflected through an angle greater than 90 degrees. So they drew some conclusions from these observations. So they concluded that the majority of the mass of an atom is concentrated in a very small uh, volume at the center of the atom, right? This makes sense. Most alpha particles are passing through this foil undeviated, so they're not hitting anything. They're just going straight through. The center of the nucleus of an atom is charged. The alpha particles are also charged, so that when they pass close to the nucleus, they're going to experience a repulsive force that's going to cause them to deviate. And only alpha particles that are passing very, very, very close to the nucleus, almost you know, hitting it head on, are going to experience a large enough repulsive force to cause them to deviate through angles greater than 90 degrees. The fact that very, so, uh, uh, very few particles did so uh, confirmed that the nucleus is in fact very small and most of the atom is empty space. So what Rutherford was also able to do is, you know, he calculated the fraction of alpha particles that he would uh, expect to be deviated through various angles. Um, and uh, he compared this with uh, the results from the experiment. He, ca he, he calculated, uh, calculated it by trying to describe the forces between the charged particles, right? And then he confirm confirmed it versus the actual experimented uh, information. And as a result of that, he calculated that the diameter of the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 15 meters of the nucleus. And uh, the diameter of the entire atom is 10 to the minus 10 for the whole, uh, for the whole atom, right? Um, some years later, the alpha particle scattering experiment was repeated using alpha particles with even higher energies. What this did was they actually found some discrepancies between the experimental results and Rutherford's scattering formula. These seem to be occurring because these high energy alpha particles were passing very, very close to the nucleus. And they were experiencing not just that repulsive electrostatic force, but also a strong attractive force, which seemed to act over a very short range only. This became known as the strong nuclear force, and it is postulated to be the thing that's actually holding the nucleus together. Think about it for a second. You're talking about a bunch of protons, positively charged protons, in a clump at the center of the atom. They're all together. Shouldn't the positively charged protons be repelling each other, right? So there's something there. It's not, it's, it's not you know, the gravitational attraction of the protons to each other that's overriding 
the electrostatic repulsion of the protons. There's in fact something else happening there and they termed it the strong nuclear force. So once they discovered this strong nuclear force, somebody, some smart guy said, huh, electrons shouldn't be affected by the strong nuclear force. Therefore, why don't we use them as a more effective tool with which to investigate the structure of the atom, right? And um, you, if you remember, we, when we were talking about the de Bois wavelength in uh, uh, chapter 25, we've said that moving, moving electrons have a wave-like property and you can diffract them, right? So if you now direct a beam of electrons at a sample of, let's say, a powdered crystal or something, right? And the electron wavelength is comparable to the interatomic spacings between the crystals. So your, your wavelength is comparable to the aperture opening. The electron waves are gonna get scattered from the planes of atoms between the tiny crystals and they will create a diffraction pattern. As a result of that, uh, the diffraction pattern is obtained that confirms a regular arrangement of atoms in a crystalline solid. That's that's pretty amazing. You know, you're, you're observing something that uh, you weren't able to before, uh, but uh, the theory actually matches up with the, the reality of the situation. Uh, measurements of the angles at which strong scattering is occurring can be used to calculate the distance between the planes of the atoms. So here's a picture of uh, something that would uh, create, uh, like, you know, a crystalline material that would create this kind of a pattern um, when you probe it using electron diffraction. If you increase the energy of the electron beam, the wavelength is gonna decrease, right? Eventually, the electron wavelength might be of the same order of magnitude as the diameter of the nucleus. And when you then probe the nucleus with high energy electrons, rather than alpha particles, that is gonna give you further insight into the dimensions of the nucleus and also gives you information about the distribution of the charge in the nucleus itself. So that these are a couple of ways that you could use, uh, you know, different, you know, small fundamental particles to go ahead and uh, probe matter. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this video. Um, I'm gonna continue on in chapter 26, talking about fundamental particles in our next video. So I'll see you there. Thank you for watching.